many times we are interested in calculating the free energy difference between two states. There are plenty of methods for doing it, but there are also um, some very interesting non-equilibrium methods. The interesting thing about them is that you don't need to go step by step by trying to reach equilibrium at each step while you're transforming your system from state A to state B. And this of course gives you the possibility to do much quicker runs and to not having to hope in the fact that you reach it equilibrium or almost equilibrium. Of course we using these methods with a short or small amount of runs could bring you to having a huge or at least a big statistical error and statistical noise but you can solve it by doing many more runs of course but let's see the two important theorems that give us the possibility to do it they are called Crookes and Jadzinski theorem in the Crookes theorem we are considering both the forward and the backwards transformation so from A to B and from B to A and we're saying that the probability of generating the quantity of work W in the forward in the forward transformation divided the probability of getting of using minus W work in the backward transformation is equal to E elevated by beta W minus delta F where delta F can be the Helmholtz free energy in ensembles with a fixed volume and the Gibbs free energy in ensembles with fixed pressure. So what does it mean? It means that in the place where PF and PB are equal, so if they are both Gaussian distributions, In the place where they do cross, that's my value of delta F. That's my energy different estimate. Of course, as you might notice by the fact that you want them to cross and you want to know where they're crossing, it's better if we have narrow peaks that are close together. Then if we have large peaks that are very separated, because in that case it would be difficult to understand where they're crossing. It will have a bigger statistical error. And usually this happens, or if you do slow transformations, so you will have to do longer runs to go from A to B and backwards B to A. Or if you have a smaller amount of molecules. So for example, if you're working with proteins, where you usually have one protein, then repeat it with PBC, you can use quite, quite fast transformations because you will still have a good superposition of the two peaks because you're having only one molecule. And of course, by the fact that we are doing both the forward and the backward transformation, we are sure that we will have the higher statistical accuracy possible. But of course, on the other side, this means that you have to do both transformations and it's not always so easy. Sometimes one side, the transformation in one direction is quite easy and the other one isn't. So the theorem that comes in help to us is the Jadzinski theorem. So this is the Jadzinski theorem, the average the value of E at the minus beta W where W is the work of my forward reaction because I said in the Jadzinski theorem we're only seeing one direction we don't work with both directions is equal to E at the minus beta delta F where delta F as said is the Helmholtz free energy if you're working for example in the canonical ensemble and the Gibbs free energy if we are working for example in the isothermal isobaric ensemble. Now, this is of course much easier. You only have to go in one direction. And it's 
yeah, in general, it's nicer to only have to do this average and you get the result. There is only one problem. This is an exponential average. The problem of exponential averages is that they can bring big biases. Because... Because if the probability, let's consider it Gaussian, of the forward distribution is Gaussian, like in this case, my exponential average will give very low importance to all this part, all the important part that is well sampled, because as we can see from the probability, we have many, many, many samplings in this part of the, of the work. And of this other tail will not be considered because e at the minus beta w in this part will be almost zero. The part that will be given more contribution to my exponential average will be this, this tail, the left tail, where we have little values of w and therefore e at the minus w will have a higher value. The problem is that this part is usually poorly sampled because we will have a, only a small percentage of our runs that will have given us values in this area. And therefore, the statistical uh, meaning, the statistical value of this result will be low. And we can, and as said, we will have a bias due to what happened here in the very poorly sampled tail. In some situations, this problem can be solved because you're able to have many, many, many results in general and therefore also a tail is well calculated and is well sampled but usually it's not so that's the reason why we need the Crookes theorem in some situations because even though this is the equation that you would like to use if possible quite often it's not possible so to make an example of a use of one of these one of these theorems and seeing also why the back reaction can be more complex. Like take, for example, we have a huge protein and we want to see uh, the binding free energy of a small ligand inside the binding pocket of the protein. The forward reaction could be to do a chem alchemical transformation and annihilate the ligand. You don't need to do much. You might need to put a little constraint on the center of mass of the ligand in order to avoid that when it's poorly coupled it goes who knows where because it has to stay more or less in the packet but that's it you will keep it for the whole time so it won't give a bias because it will keep existing in the whole transformation it will simply keep my ligand there it would be like if you put an infinite mass on one of the atoms near to the center of mass, only to keep the ligand more or less in that area. That's all what you're interested in. And that's not a big deal. The problem is that if you would like to do the reverse one, it's not so easy, because you will need to have a quite important restraint at the beginning to keep it the ligand exactly at the center of the pocket in order to avoid to create it some random places where you are absolutely not interested in and that will give you absolutely no information on what you are doing. But of course, if you keep this, this very strong position restraint and the fact that the center of mass doesn't only have to stay more or less near the area without many problems, but you really want to keep it exactly there and now you're not sampling properly the whole conformational space of the system because of course it could recouple in many different ways if you didn't constrain it. So you might need to have a constraint that isn't constant. You have to remove it slowly while you are creating your ligand in order to give it the possibility to move and give it a less bias. But of course that's again a problem because in this case you will have to more or less understand your your constraint, your strain, how it influenced your 
free energy estimate. And like, so again, your free energy estimate in the end will be as good as your ability to understand your constraint you put it there, how strongly it influenced your results. So uh, that's first, that was a small example, but it was a way to show you that in which situation you could use this kind of runs and why the Crookes theorem, even though it gives you a good result, can be problematic because you want to do this non-equilibrium things because you want to put as little bias as possible in the system and let it evolve as freely as possible. As I said, in order to avoid putting a uh, bias on it by choosing poorly the reaction coordinate. In this way, you don't even have a reaction coordinate. You don't care about it. But in order to, for example, create a ligand inside the exact binding pocket, you will need to put a big restraint. And this, of course, will, be, will actually give you a bias due to the restraint. If you reduce the restraint, you will have your ligand creating itself who knows where, creating huge energies and a huge amount of work and it will simply give you very poor results. So, of course, there is no perfect solution. You will always have to consider the pros and the cons of both the, the equations and of both. And they will, of course, be dependent on the system you're studying and how interested you are in having no restraints and no biases. In the end, another interesting thing you can say about non-equilibrium thermodynamics, so it's simply a small curiosity, is that actually you can derive in the end that or going from A to B is always bigger or equal to delta F. And this is nothing more than the second principle of thermodynamics for non-equilibrium. So we can see that even though in non-equilibrium simulations, it's not always true that the work is bigger or equal to the difference of free energy. It's true on average. So on average, a non-equilibrium process will still respect the second principle of thermodynamics. I hope you enjoyed the video. All the sources and the materials I used to do it are written in the description below. And here is some more content for you. But wait, don't click on it yet. First remember to leave a feedback in the comments section to let me know what you think about it. Like, subscribe, follow me on social media, links in the description. And if you would like to support the channel, consider to donate on Patreon. Again, link in the description below. See you next time. I'm Maurice Karnbrook for The Computational Chemist.